Hey everybody and welcome to the Get Your Hansen show. It's Get Your Hansen and today got a special guest. It was supposed to be the person that was my final interview under the Kurtz Angle banner, but kind of like that rebrand, it's just it didn't really work out really, did it? Um got the Reach Academy champion, Joey Seven. Joey, thank you for coming on. Anytime, mate. Nice to speak to you. Again. Yeah, good, good to talk again. So just for clarification, um we were supposed to, it's 16th of August, we're supposed to release your interview today. And when I went through the editing stage, Skype decided to save, I think, three and a half minutes on one of it. But then if I opened on a different thing, it allowed us to watch about six minutes of it. And it went over an hour. So that wasn't great. So here we are doing it all again. And like what it was the first time, I'll let you explain your story to the people. We'll just be speaking more or less like it's the first time, really, and it's good to have you back on. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you again, mate. I mean, I still feel like the first one was good to release. I mean, three and a half minutes of us is uh, as good as an hour with anybody else, <laughs> probably. Definitely. So uh, I think we'll go up to like, talking about Yokozuna um, and Mr. Fuji, but we'll get back into that. And Really, <laughs> I've still got the hour. Just the first chat went so well, I thought, ah, let's just say it's broken and we'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, kicking off like with your career and things like that, what was the earliest memory um, of you with wrestling? And then what? why did you decide, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to just get absolutely battered for the rest of my life inside a ring. Yeah, um, well, the, the, my first memory was uh, WrestleMania 9. And um, it was the first exposure I'd had to any sort of wrestling at all. Um, and it was the the event at Caesar's Palace, and it starts off with Bobby the Brain coming down backwards on a camel, <laughs> and Macho Man. Um, yeah, and and I I just couldn't quite believe what I was watching, really. And then the first ever match that I saw them would have been um, Shawn Michaels and Tatanka, um, which you know, if you're going to start watching wrestling, start with Shawn Michaels, right? Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah. So that was that was that, and. Um, and then I just remember the the chloroform angle with uh, the Undertaker and the Giant Gonzalez, and then um, yeah, Hogan coming in and making the save in the Yokozuna Bret Hart match. Um, yeah, and actually, just a, a nice little sort of throw forward. Um, when I wrestled Carl Parker, we were just throwing a few ideas around for um, what we wanted to do, and. And it just struck me that we had this kind of cocky show off bad guy against a, you know, sort of straight, straight as shooting, more powerful um, baby face. And I just said, let's do the start of the WrestleMania nine match. So, <laughs> so that was, um, yeah. So when, when I wrestled Carl, it was literally the start of um, Shawn Michaels and, and uh, Tatanka, which was kind of nice for me to kind of, uh, go back to my sort of very first memory yeah. in front of a, a crowd. And, all, and also I figured that, you know, when I went back and asked people if they thought it was any good, if they, you know, criticised the start, I could just say, well, take it up with Shawn Michaels. <laughs> um, I'm glad you went with that start and you didn't go with the chloroform angle because I don't <laughs> think that'd be a good way to kickstart your career, would you? <laughs> no, although there were plenty of people that would like to see Carl choked with chloroform, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, for those that may not be familiar, Carl Parker, again, somebody from the Reach Academy. Um, very charismatic, but he knows how to wind people up in the ring, and especially on social media, being ever so creative. You can listen to one of my um, interviews with Carl. But when, So, obviously, you grew up as a fan. Did you ever get yeah. out of wrestling at any point? Or... Um... No, I didn't really get out of it. I, I always um I always watched it and I always followed it and, and um 
it, it had always sort of from that point been in the back of my mind that it's something that I I would like to do and to see if I could be any good at. But when you're, I mean, I can't even remember how old I was. I mean, <laughs> how did you get into wrestling? Um, and and then when I when I uh, started secondary school, just just uh, I always played football, and then I started playing rugby. Um, and sort of as I sort of progressed, I, I got pretty decent at rugby and sort of was around a few sort of pro clubs. Um, so, I, it, I mean, I didn't sort of uh, fall out with wrestling. I just, I just had other things going on. Um, and then I, I uh, had a couple of injuries um, and, a, and a, a bad one at the end playing rugby and um, had to take a bit of a break. And, and when I came back, I just wasn't as good as I was before. And I thought, I'm not going to keep doing something that I used to be better at. I'm going to yeah. think of something that I'm, you know, going to improve at. And that's when I bumped into an old mate of mine um, who uh, worked commentary uh, yeah. for a couple of companies and just got Grayson Reeves' number um, or, or maybe just a name. But I, I got in touch with, with Grayson and just said, look, mate, I don't know if I'll be any good at this, but, you know, I, I guarantee that I'll, I'll give it everything to, to see. Um, yeah, and that weekend I showed up at, they were training at Brickfields at the time. Um, and Grayson wasn't actually there that day. Uh, it was Jason. So, and I hadn't met or seen Jason before. So I basically just sort of like thought I'm going to walk up to the most tan bloke in the room and just assume that that's a wrestler. And <laughs> if you've ever seen Jason, you know, that, that was, that was the correct decision. <laughs> no, definitely. What injury was it that you had with rugby? Uh, I broke my leg. Um, yeah, I just uh, I got tackled by one guy, but kind of stayed on my feet and was sort of fighting to stay on my feet. And then uh, I got hit by another guy, which kind of spun me. But because the other guy had hold of my legs, my sort of my my foot stayed in the ground and my body spun, so my foot just kind of snapped back. And um, oh. yeah, um, and it was the the guy that made the second hit heard it, so that sort of yeah, was that was the end of that. Um, yeah, not oh, great. No, it makes me cringe. Like similar to yourself, played football quite a lot, decent standard, and yeah, like two. Well, at the time now it's free, but at the time it was two torn MCLs, and it's oh, like mm, probably not best. Like nearly snap a bit like yourself, nearly snapped my kneecap in a half mm. um, from playing football, and it was just a case of. Yeah, I think it's time to time to give it up now. And yeah. how is it prepared? So, do you think it's prepared you though playing rugby? Um, obviously, you're used to taking the big hits and mm. um, landing on your back on essentially solid ground um, during the summers and things like that. Do you yeah. think that's prepared you from stepping into the ring and taking the hits? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Just, just you saying landed on the solid ground in the summer that that's always made me laugh that. You'd um, you turn up to a game in the winter and the pitch would be frozen and people saying, "Oh no, this is dangerous. We can't play on this." And then you turn up to a, a pre-season game in August and the the field's like a road and everyone's yeah. saying, what a "Brilliant day for rugby!" It is and I never got that. No, um, I always <laughs> preferred the cold winter because it'd still be the frost to kind of yeah still yeah. Get it. You know, I'm, a, I'm a soft ground horse for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it um it definitely prepared me um, because if you if you think. You know, aside if you if you take the ball out of a game of rugby, you're running, making a hit, wrestling, getting up on your feet, running, making a hit, wrestling, getting up on your feet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've been lucky that that sort of replicated it really well. Um, and also, I think I've I've benefited from already being at the bottom of a sport and starting off and kind of working my way up to being one of the sort of like the senior people. Yeah. Um, because obviously now I'm back to being one of the newer guys. Um, yeah, and I think that that kind of experience has helped. You know, the the hours that I stood under the goalposts when the internationals were goal kicking and practicing their kicks and just catching the balls, throwing them back. Yeah. It just kind of, you know, teaches you that for for a, for a, a good couple of years, you know, your your role is going to be doing what you're told and and uh, just trying to get better. And and I don't think that lesson's ever wasted, really. No, like, so just for the time scale, because, again, you've not been in the industry for long. And for somebody, um, like, 
for your longevity in the business. She's still so new, but it doesn't automatically tell that in the ring. Like, you're just natural athlete. You've taken to it so quickly. When was it that you did start training? Um, it would have been <clears throat> October 2018. <laughs> yeah, and then... I had my first match, I think, in April 2019. Yeah. So, what's that, six months? Just um, skyrocketed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it was quick. It, I think you can always look back and you, it felt too quick because you 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 always want to be better than you are. Yeah. Um, but you've you've got to start right. I mean, you've got to have your first match, and you've got to you've ju- just got to go through those first few steps. So. Let's talk about that first match. So you'd have been doing stuff um, behind closed doors in the academy, but when was that first match in front of an audience? Um, so that was that was in <clears throat> in April two thousand nineteen, but it wasn't actually. It didn't uh, turn out how the kind of the plan for me was supposed to go. I was supposed to make my debut against Grayson, which. Um, I think is a fairly sort of typical road into it. You know, you kind of wrestle your coach for a, a few matches and then somebody that, you know, has been brought in to help with training. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then at a, a show uh, not long before, um, uh, Grayson hurt his knee real bad, you know. Um, and I, <laughs> I was actually there watching and it was a strange, strange situation because I've I've seen people do it before and and whenever people... Whenever people really injure themselves, the the expression on their face isn't pain. It's it's a panic of how they're going to get themselves out of the situation they're in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as soon as he did it, I knew what he'd done. Um, but there was an inexperienced referee, and he and he wouldn't put the X's up. Um, so people would stop me trying to get to him just to sort of like drag him out of the ring until he kind of we made eye contact and he sort of waved me in, get, get me out of here. Um, so I was actually the one that carried him to the back. And then uh, after the match, uh, Grayson and Jason were kind of talking about his his bookings that and the, the bookings that they had coming up. And they were kind of looking at each other and looking at me and looking at each other and looking at me and just basically said, you're Grayson for the next few months. You know, you're in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, so I started off um, on a reach show uh, in a, a six-man tag. Or that ended up being a sort of three on four man tag. Um, and then, yeah, did a few couple of other uh, shows. And then I, I wrestled on the first Bodmin show, which was supposed to be my match against Grayson against yeah. Josh. So that was kind of my start. Um, so, what was it like with the six man when you first jumping in on that one? Uh, intimidating, to be honest, because uh, it, was, it was pretty much like a who's who of. Um, the wrestlers around at the moment. Yeah. Who I was, uh, it was. It started off, and it was going to be uh, <clears throat> Charlie Sterling, um, Bino, and Lucian Phillips against Lance Cole, Brendan White, and Josh Knott. And then they go out, and uh, Charlie switches teams. You know, horrific yeah. heel move. Um, so they say, you know, we thought this was going to happen. We've got somebody of our own, and they they bring me out. Um, and apart from Josh, I don't think I've met any of them before ever. Um, Bloody hell. So, and, and they were guys that I'd seen work a lot. And they were kind of, you know, they're, they're guys that are sort of towards the top of the tree, particularly a few of them. Um, I mean, personally, I think that Charlie Sterling is the most complete wrestler that we've got in Britain at the moment, at least what I've seen. Yeah, um, yeah so, so it was intimidating. But, yeah, I have to say that they were great. You know, they... Um, they sort of kept it simple for me and looked after me. And um, and I actually started with Josh, who, you know, was the only one that I, I sort of knew. Um, and, yeah, they were they were really talking me through it. Even, you know, the the people on the on the apron just literally just giving me step by step instructions, even, you know, just to take a pause, show out to the crowd, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they, they were as, as good as they could have been. Um, and it <clears throat> yeah, finished with me taking Josh's dastardly cowbell between the eyes. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, for those of you that um, are interested, I was just having a look. So it's on your fight site. You can do the um, British Wrestling subscription, and that match it's the Reach Final Four show. And again, Bino, yourself, Psycho Phillips, and then you've got Bren, Brendan White, Charlie Sterling, Josh Knott, and Lance Cole. And like you said, with Charlie Sterling, he, he's now the Reach champion, um, mm-hmm. and he's doing some fantastic stuff in RTT, done some great stuff in Rev Pro. So talk about an education and Baptist by Fire, there's you, just you're helping out at shows, paying your dues, and your debut's not an academy show, it's straight in with... Um, some of the brightest talent in the UK, especially in the uh, Southwest area. Uh, what was the feedback you got like after that? Um, <clears throat> it was kind of it was it was quite a chaotic situation. It was a, it was a strange thing. I think I don't know if something had to change on the card or if somebody was running late. But we we weren't supposed to be on first, um, as as memory serves me. Um, and then you know our match was moved to first. And there, there are kind of lots of moving pieces. Um, so it was all put together in a bit of a rush. Um, and then I, literally as we were kind of walking out to stand behind the curtain, Charlie just said, we don't have a finish. And he just went, ah, oh, we'll work it out when we're out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, which was just what you want to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, so I think, I think the match in part sort of lost its way a bit. I don't think the... The fan, like the viewer, would really notice, but the, there were like a couple of bits that you could pick out. Um, but yeah, I think a few of them were sort of happy with bits. It was kind of mixed, and and then um, I think Brendan was pretty cross about a couple of things. Um, and then he, once he'd calmed down, he kind of said, "You know, if if that was your first match, mate, you did great. I, to be honest, I probably couldn't have got through that first time round. It's it's quite something to be thrown into. So he did really well." Um, and Lance was great. He kind of took me aside and uh, and just and just kind of identified the the pauses in the match that I yeah. needed to use to kind of you know there are a couple of spots that they set up to make me look strong you know make a bit of a comeback and and after that I kind of needed to explode with a bit of energy and get the crowd into it. Um, so he just sort of picked out those bits and, and said you know as as you know the sort of baby face that you are you really need to start working on that. Um, yeah, so great, really, really helpful, you know. <clears throat> oh, no, good. Um, cause it is like one thing that everybody's um, said about you when I've been speaking is the fact that you are, you're always asking for advice, you're always going up to people and asking what they think and paying that respect and willing to take that criticism to show where you can learn and hopefully implement that in the future. So fast forward to um, your second Reach match then, it was the Reach Invasion show, and yeah. you've got that Josh Knott match. Talk us through that because you've had a chaotic four on three. Yeah. But now you're taking away the six other guys to help you through it, and it's just a one on one. What was your mind going through when you knew, right, second match, singles match? Here you go. Um, well, I mean, the first thing was that I I was lucky to have Josh. You know, I I uh, trust Josh completely, and I and I think that. Um, Josh is one of the best workers around and uh, the only person that doesn't believe that is Josh, which is the only thing that's, that is stopping him from being wherever he wants to be, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So, so that was good. Unfortunately on the day, <laughs> typical sort of typical of my journey so far, it's never been easy. I, uh, I, I hurt myself pretty badly. Um, on the day, we we had a seminar from uh, Chris Andrews, and at the end of that, we were kind of running through, just you know, putting a few little practice matches together. Um, and somebody picked me up for a, a back suplex, and instead of just dropping me flat, just kind of, just kind of pivoted on their feet and just fell backwards and fell backwards until we both sort of landed on my head. <laughs> um, so, and it was one of them where it, you just can't. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't. Um, it just rattled rattled my sort of spine and my, my neck up so much that so I couldn't really breathe. I, like walking was about as good as I was. I couldn't jump. Um, so when Josh turned up and said, what do you want to do? I, I had to break break the news to him. I, I said, say, mate, I, I'm really sorry. I can't really do anything. You're just going to have to beat me up. Um, and 
yeah, and he did, <laughs> and he and he and he made it look good. And his his pacing was so good; like he didn't he didn't make me do too much. Uh, he instead made everything mean something, and yeah, and, um, did loads of you know get, getting stuck into the crowd. I've, I've watched the match a load of times, and I think he takes me off my feet once or twice. Oh wow! So just like just unbelievable from him, really, just getting me through it. Um, the the match itself, it, it, um, the pain wasn't so bad because like I was so full of adrenaline my first singles match and <laughs> adrenaline and drugs that I um, I couldn't really feel the pain too bad. But then literally as as soon as I knew it was the finish and the referee was counting, the pain just came back. And if yeah. you watch the match, I'm literally climbing up the referee to try and get back <laughs> to my feet. Um, yeah, so so it was it was another lesson, you know. It's you're gonna get hurt. You're going to have to look after each other and, and you're going to have to try your best. And and uh, I don't think if you turned up and watched that match, you'd have thought, oh, there was something wrong or he was really hurt. So I think that in the circumstances, that's probably about as, as well as I could have done. So, yeah. Right. All credit to yourself. Um, the fact that you're still so early in your career and you was like, actually, I'm going to have to tell him. You see it so many times where people work where they're extremely hurt, not telling the other person, and it's putting the other person at risk as well. Um, yep. Josh must be stood there thinking, what do I have to do to get an opponent that stays fit? Grayson gets injured. You're <laughs> like, hey, I've just got hurt this morning. Um, how like, how did you bounce back after that, like following that injury? Um, I mean... Injury wise, it, it was just one of those things that needed some rest, really. I mean, I didn't need much to kind of bounce back. Um, I think shortly after that, I uh, had co- had a sort of a fairly quick succession of matches um, because I, I think maybe one or two matches later, I went on and did uh, my first summer on the camps for Haven for All Star. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was. I mean, that was perfect for me. What I, what I needed at the time, or what I need, you know, just just matches. You know, it's literally at least one match a day, sometimes two, sometimes more. Drive drive into a camp, sticking the ring up, having a match. Um, oh, brilliant! You get you know a new bunch of people every week. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's perfect. How like how many like how many days would you work in with All Star? Um. <laughs> I think that that loop is. Uh, I think there's two matches on Saturday, one Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then I think again on Friday. I think you have like maybe one day off. I can't remember yeah. exactly, but yeah, there's one day off for sure. But it's it's one or two matches every other day. Yeah, no, that's a education in itself, then really. Um, all Star is, a, and even any of the camps, whether it's NGW or even WAW, working on those camps is a big learning experience. Mm. What got what got you that opportunity so early in your career? I think <clears throat> Kean Fox and the UK Dominator were kind of uh, they shared responsibility for the Southwest Loop, and um, I think Kean got in touch with. Grayson maybe and um, asked if he had anybody that that would be good or that you know could do with a summer on the camps and put my name forward and um, yeah and he called me and it's the f- the first time we'd ever really spoken to each other and you know we had a chat and we got on well and I just said look you know I'm not going to be the best best worker you've ever seen but you know I'll I'll turn up I'll be on time I'm reliable and I'll and I'll do as I'm told and that's all I can offer you at the moment um, and he said yeah cool. Um, so he got me on as much as he could, and uh, yeah, it was it was fantastic. Nah, but like, what was it like for you then? So so early in your career, you are used to the people that come to your shows, they're wrestling fans, and then you go to the camps where it's an all of a beast. That were essentially, it's not people that are going to watch wrestling; it's families that are on holiday and like, right, let's just go watch the entertainment that's on for that evening. So what was that like working for a crowd that essentially 75% of them, if not more, aren't wrestling fans? Yeah, I mean, it, it's um, I personally, from what I've seen, think it's the best place to learn. And I've, I've heard lots of other people say that. 
and it's it is a massive challenge because like you say you know it's it's parents with their kids that um that are there just for some entertainment they turn up to to the room and it could be karaoke it could be a comedian it could be wrestling but you know they're just there for some entertainment so they they've not seen your social media they've not seen any sort of video hype they've literally no no idea who you are and you've got 10 15 minutes to walk out in front of a crowd and by the end of it you know see if you can get them on their feet and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't and some people can and some people can't um but i mean it's an incredible um skill to have um to really kind of be able to sort of manipulate the the crowd and and control a crowd's reaction um and also you know the 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 quality of of talent on there i mean you know you do hear about people that that look down upon the camps but honestly the level of quality on the camps that i've seen is is unrivaled by any any other show that i've been on in terms of sort of experience professionalism um you know walk working all over the world and i think that the people that in fact i've heard joel say that the people that talk bad about the camps the people that have tried it and can get over yeah um and also like there's there's a few places where you know if if that room's packed it's it's a few, good few thousand people you know oh, yeah, it's it, going to be your biggest crowd yeah 100 percent. so it's brilliant and i had um i had some great crews that i was i was going around with and and one guy in particular um was just so much help help to me he's um a liverpool guy called um tyson taylor um, okay. He's one of um, Dean Allmark's sort of top students, or yeah. I mean, years ago, a top student. You know, he's a great, great worker on his own right now. Um, yeah, and he and he was literally just step by step coaching me through the crowd work. So it, you know, it snapped me down onto the onto the canvas, grab hold of me, and the first night he'd say, he, he'd he'd kind of wait and he'd say, right, you're hearing that, you're hearing that building, that's what you're listening for, that's what you're listening for. Okay, now fight back, and then. The next night, it snapped me down, and he'd say, "Right, remember what we said yesterday. When you think you're hearing them, when you think you've got them, I want you to fight back." And I'd wait and I'd wait and I'd fight back, and he'd be like, "Yeah, that was right." Then the third night, bang! Right, I'm not even going to speak to you. Just fight back when you want to fight back, and and just, you know, I've never <clears throat> thanked him to his face about that. So hopefully, um, he's listening because that was just like, yeah, I just couldn't buy that. You know, that yeah. he he decided to do that for me. I. I you know that's that's priceless for me. No, and I think that is one thing that um, I've got from the camps. Whether speaking to yourself just now, when I spoke to Joel, or even like with a further north, the people that do the runs, I've spoken to Nathan Cruz. That's done the All Star route. Um, he's done the NGW camps as well. Uh, and John Skyler came over from America, just like people like Brian Danielson and Cash Wheeler yeah. have done, and yeah. worked the camps for All Star and Butlins, and they said exactly the same. Where the people that complain about it are people that like can't get over because they like the, the fans that know what's happening essentially and mm. because they can't do something cheap to get these people invested. It's yeah. a lot harder because, like you said, you go in there, you've got to introduce yourself especially as a baby face as well. I think it's a lot harder to be the, like, it's a lot easier to be the villain. You just got to be a dick, come across as the dick. Yeah. But when you're that baby face, you've got to give somebody a reason to invest in you straight from the beginning. Mm. Um, and I think that is why it's such a good education for people in in Britain. Like if you're a wrestler, you need to be on the camps. Definitely. I wouldn't stop it for anything. And um, any opportunity that I had to do it again, I'd, I'd snatch it. Um and and if you look at you know the 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 top top people in in WWE over the over the past twenty five years, a lot of them have been through the camps. Yeah. Um, I think I read in Jericho's book actually that he he did did the All Star Run a few times. Um, yeah, it's it's um it's it's an amazing place to learn. I did. Um, I think it was the day after Boxing Day or. Maybe sometime around Christmas, um, I did uh, a camp for WAW in Western Supermare. Yeah, and and if, this is just a good description of what it is. So we're behind the curtain, and we're you know we're getting our gear on. I'm doing a few press ups, you know, getting a 
bit of oil on me so the ropes don't burn me and getting ready to go. And you can hear the, the bingo numbers being called out the front because, you know, you're, you're there after the bingo. And then you're still sat there and someone comes back and says, you know, sorry, lads, you know, it's going to be a little bit later. The bingo's over running. And, um, and then <clears throat> you go out there. So you've got a sea of people that are still there because they, they couldn't be bothered to leave after the bingo. And, um, and yeah, you've got one shot to get them. And I looked out, uh, I locked up with um, the guy, James, that I was wrestling with. And I looked out and there was a guy asleep on the floor. He'd brought his own pillow just in case he found it so boring that he was going to be asleep. And I just thought, this game will always humble you. <laughs> Literally asleep on the floor. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, you know, I, I walked back to sort of high fives and a few cheers. And I think, you know, if you if you can do that, you then put yourself in front of, of in front of a crowd that like wrestling, have paid to watch wrestling and know who you are. I mean, you're, you're winning, really. Yeah, no, definitely. So moving back to, like, with the um, the Reach stuff. So obviously you've mentioned in the intro, Reach Academy champion, the one and only, and you'd won the anniversary battle royal at 365 days later. What was that experience like working, one, working the battle royal, but um, to be in that Reach Academy champion? Yeah, that I mean the that battle rule was kind of the first inclination that I had um, <clears throat> that they decided that I was going to be the person I was going to be the guy yeah. for a while. Um, yeah, because they they kind of told me the plan. They said, you know, you're going to win this battle royal and then go on um, to to wrestle for the the Reach uh, Academy Championship. And it was just just so humbling, really, when more and more people were being introduced as competitors in the battle battle royal and you know i just thought i've got no business beating these people um yeah like pj jones was in it jason king was in it um and yeah it was almost embarrassing really that we were kind of you know that i'd have to sort of turn up at the venue and 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 that was the situation but again you know everybody was just super cool super professional worked you know me and pj were the last two in there and he was fantastic and you know did everything he could for me um yeah so that was kind of that was the first uh inclination that i had that 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 was what they had planned for me and it was funny little story it wasn't until uh a while after that jason said do you know why we why we chose you and i said no. And he said, obviously, we wanted somebody that we, we could trust and we thought were good enough. But after one of the shows, I looked out and you were the last guy sweeping up. And that's a lesson for anybody, you know. Um, it doesn't matter if, if you're the best or the worst. Let people know that you're going to be honest and work hard for it. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, then it was uh, Josh Knott reared his head and decided that nobody was worthy of the the challenge within the academy and that he was going to take it into his his own hands like that is such a, a fantastic like coming together and stuff the fact that it was supposed to be a fair singles match and he's just had to beat the living shit out of you because you got injured yeah. earlier in the day and then you've just won that battle royal and you've gone on to that first the match for the academy title against josh so what was that match like then, going into it? Like, was did you do any training beforehand, or did you think, nope, not even risking it? No, yeah, just sort of trained as normal, but you know, didn't do anything on the day. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a good match. I, I thought it was great. Um, it was my, it would, it was my first experience of um, being in the main event on a show um, and sort of being in a title match. So it was kind of, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of switched from, I kind of have two roles, you know, I'm kind of like the rookie in the in the um, the main roster locker room and then I'm kind of one of the leaders in the, the academy show locker room. So, um, yeah, that was a different experience, you know. I was, It was my face on the poster and it was Josh and I in the main event and it was so, you know, people kind of looking for us to carry it and sell it out, which we did. Um, yeah, and the match was great, you know, and it was it was kind of nice to be able to do that with Josh because we'd both been looking, well, 
I'd been looking forward. He probably hadn't. I'd been looking forward to our match in Bodmin, um, but couldn't really give him much. So, yeah, I think um, people enjoyed the match. You know, it kind of got the reaction that we wanted. Um, I think Josh was on a, a, a double duty, like the honest grafter he is, and went to another show that evening. And a few people that were there said that, you know, he, he really enjoyed the match and said that, you know, he thought I was good. So, yeah, that was great. And, and obviously, you know, lifting the... Uh, Lifting the title at the end. Cause how many days has it been now? Oh. hell of a long time. Yeah, you put me on the put me under the cosh there. I don't know exactly <laughs> how wide. Um, I think it's about it's got to be nine months now. Yeah, but I mean, with this pandemic carrying on, I'm going to have a Bruno type run. Nobody's going to touch it. <laughs> yeah. Like you've seen it in NXT UK with Kaylee Ray. Um, she probably was gonna break it anyways, but yeah. she's now the longest reigning because she's sat at home, nobody can touch her. And um, how you been finding the pandemic? Like, how you been finding? Because I know you guys at Reach have just started going back doing your training, but yeah. like everybody else, for so many months, three, four, five months, about three, four months, you didn't have much to do because of this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, hard. Um, you know, especially right at the beginning, there was so much uncertainty around how bad it was going to get and what everybody would be allowed to do and what we wouldn't be allowed to do. Um, you know, kind of as from the wrestling side of things, it was hard, you know, looking in the mirror every day and seeing the kind of the decay, you know, my, my kind of body um, wasting a little bit, um, knowing that, you know, when when we come back, you know, people have seen it now. They've, they've there's kind of a, a look that people expect of me. So I was kind of anxiously watching this process, thinking, what you know, how bad is it going to get? When's it going to stop? Because there's only <laughs> still so much you can do at home. Um, yeah, but thankfully, it you know, there's going to be a few months before anybody's going to need to see me in my trunks yet. <laughs> um, but no, it's been tough, and um, it's uh, it almost feels harder harder now you know because in lockdown you were kind of it was what it was but now it's kind of the world started again but without all of the fun things so it's kind of like you're doing all the kind of the monotonous stuff that you have to do every day but there are like none of the cool things to do at the weekend but yeah good to be back training yeah now it's been difficult obviously um it was the what second anniversary of reach supposed to be at the plymouth guild hall and then that had been cancelled and then like fast forward, we we're supposed to have the ultimate weekend in October, and mm. that's again just been um, cancelled. And it's frustrating seeing one like all the people that do this is their full time living. It's everybody's livelihood. There's a reason why people are wrestling, and to keep getting that denied, denied, denied. I'm just hoping like 2021. I think it may be one of the better years. I'm hoping. I think it'll be. A lot of people are worried for the industry, but. I think it might have the positive effect. I think it's making wrestlers and fans appreciate it a lot more. And Mm. I can't wait to be like, to see what that audience and that crowd's going to be like on that fair show back for companies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I feel massively for, for all promoters. Obviously I know Jason and Grayson the best, Um, knowing how much work that they put into, you know, preparing these things and, Um, you know obviously we weren't we weren't sure how things were going to kind of unfold over the last couple of months Um, and actually because of the the nature of it being a weekend of the the wrestlers themselves we were kind of I guess would have ended up being in the sort of bubble that you see sports teams being in because we'd have just traveled together from from each place and stayed stayed in the same place so maybe hoping that that might given us more of a chance but um yeah i spoke to them when the first venue pulled and it's kind of you know you can you can secure your or try and secure another venue but the, when the second venue went down it's kind of you know sometimes you got to know when you're beat and but i you know i really felt felt for them or still do you know it's um a lot of work gone, goes into that and um yeah i feel bad for them no um 
hopefully it's not going to be too long before we do get back to things. But um, I want to jump back into like your reach career again. Um, the one and only like academy champion. You've been absolutely killing it, given so many different opportunities as well. Um, I believe you'd had match where you teaming with Lee Hunter and Luke Phoenix. And what was that like working with them? Fantastic. Um, I mean, two super experienced guys. And again, just um, just unbelievably generous. You know, when they were kind of putting the match together, um, you know, we'll take the heat, you know, they'll, they'll sort of take the beat. And, you know, you, we want you to have the, um, you know, the big hot tag, make a comeback, look strong. Just, yeah, it's kind of been been a sort of constant throughout my career so far, just how generous of be- people have been to me and sort of given me, um, you know, sort of respect that I haven't earned and um, just giving more than I deserve, really. And 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 those guys were no different. And they, <clears throat> they were great to work with. And obviously, we were, you know, in there with um, Danny Luna, who's signed with WWE now and, you know, well-deserved and um, experiment in terror. But yeah, no, I enjoyed the match. I think um, uh, we got a really good crowd reaction, and and I've watched that match back a few times. Um, and I actually spoke. I saw Luke the other day, just kind of by chance, <clears throat> um, and said that I've watched that match because it was really helpful to sh- to kind of view myself against those two. Because what I've really learned with, with wrestling is that. The, the wrestling is the easy bit. So, you know, the moves and the, the positioning and stuff is, isn't, isn't particularly difficult if you're a good athlete, but it's all the, all the little tiny things that they do in the spaces and the pauses between the wrestling that they're just yeah. so much better than me at. And I was telling him that, that I, I've watched that match a lot and just picked up on every little mannerism or look or expression or um, every little cell. Um, yeah, so that, that match was great for me for that reason, being around those guys for that. Yeah, like, and again, you've only been in the industry for just shy of two years, and like the second year barely counts. We only touched a few months of it, um, yeah. but you're still getting the respect of such, um, like veterans in the industry and um, people that are, like you said, held with high regard. Um, what's it been like working with Breach then, going through your training and things like that? Because obviously <clears throat> you've got Jason and Grace, and how's it been? developing under them and some of the fantastic guest trainers they've brought in yeah it's been it's been fantastic um i think <clears throat> grayson and, and jason deserve a huge amount of credit because the reason in my opinion why the academy has been so successful has been the um the uh, sort of atmosphere and the community that they've created yeah and that's absolutely down to those two um, you've probably got a, a, a few of the um, the people in the in the academy with a bit of seniority that kind of facilitate that, but but that comes from the top with those two. Um, I mean, I don't know how much time you've spent around them. Um, I mean, J- Jason is the most infectious person I've ever known in my life. Um, the most enthusiastic and the most positive. Like he's the sort of bloke that anything he wanted to do anything that he wanted to create or sell, he could do it because of the character that he is. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and for that, for that reason, I think that he'll be, when he decides that he's done wrestling, he'll be a remarkable, um, you know, manager, Jim Cornette, you know, sort of mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart type of thing. Oh, hundred percent. Like, my interview with Jason had to be split into two parts. It wasn't recorded as two <laughs> parts. I needed to find where to do a natural break because we spoke yeah. like two and a half hours and I was like, yeah, at least that as a whole. But I've, you know, I've heard people pull him up on, on some of his limitations and I don't know if, if like it's a British thing, but just focusing on what people can't do brilliantly instead of focusing on what people do do brilliantly. Like Jason, Jason can walk into a room in front of a crowd and within two minutes you'll either love him or you'll hate him. Not meant, not, not many people can do that. No. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he's incredibly gifted in that way. And, um, and, and Matt kind of compliments Jason by just being a, a details guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of that 
Jason will make you feel like you can do anything. Jason will kind of inspire you to believe that you can be what you want to be. And then Matt will kind of get you there and tell you how to do it and definitely tell you how not to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, you know, Matt's underrated. Matt's a, Matt's a good wrestler. Don't worry about that. He, um, yeah, he's great. And, um, or Grayson, sorry. Um, yeah. So, so they're a great team. And, and then we've been, um, we've been blessed with, uh, the people that we've had coming in for, for seminars. Um, and I think the the success of Reach as a brand, it's almost been like, it's been a perfect storm of kind of conditions in the area. So yeah. you've got two people who who um, who decided that they want to do wrestling properly in the Southwest. And, and it was before my time, but I've heard enough people saying that, you know, it wasn't always the case. So you've got two people that know how to... Um, create stories, long-term booking. They know how to keep people's attention and keep people wanting to see more. Um, and, and you know, not just throw a couple of names on a poster and hope that people will turn up. Mm-hmm. People are really invested in the Reach storylines. And then when you add to that, you've got two of probably the best wrestlers in, in the country that are just in their prime. You've got Joel Redman and Eddie Ryan, who I think Eddie's 13 years in and I think Joel's 15 years in who are kind of, you know, at the top of their game. And they're, they're in the area and passionate about, um, you know, wrestling in the, in the Southwest being yeah. good and respected. And then <clears throat> you've also got people that Joel trained, like PJ Jones, Josh Knott, um, Nick Riley, who have all had 10 years wrestling now and, and are, again, you know, they want wrestling to be good in the area and, and they're all... Um, you know, unbelievably helpful, make themselves available to to help out, give seminars, um, and and you know, work their ass off when they're booked on a show. Yeah. So it's kind of everything's kind of come together, and then you know, the the academy's sort of been successful. And I think once you've got a kind of a, an established backbone of a brand, you know, people like seeing people from Corbin and Devon come in. You know, people like myself and and LA Taylor coming in. You know, that are local people that they could kind of jump on board with from step one and watch kind of climb the ladder. Yeah, no, 100%. And you mentioned it in the, uh, I think you put it on Facebook and Twitter where you're doing the videos if you're going to call yourself the best kept secret and then you just turn it to a I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm guessing you do feel like LA's at that standard. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean... For one thing, I mean, how many attractive blonde six foot women are there? So, you know, straight away she's at the top of the pile. Yeah. Um, you know, there are there are some things that you can't learn and having her look you can't learn. And yeah, she's she's um getting better all the time. I think she she wouldn't mind me saying that as far as an athlete goes, she's not the most natural, but like she I just respect her more and more every time, you know, I see her work out. Like I've the amount of times I've seen her collapse from working so hard, you know, literally falling in the middle of a run just because she literally runs until she can't, can't go anymore. Um, yeah, it should be great. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. Like again, everyone can check that one out. Uh, my interview with LA. And that's one thing that I like about reach Academy is it's so diverse. It isn't a case of, Here's another one that's exactly the same as the other star they've just produced because they've yeah. just got the one trick. And before you know it, the full Academy show is like, have you seen that meme with Spider-Man where it's pointing at each other? Yeah. It's basically like that where it's just carbon copies, but that's yeah. not the case with Reach. Like, um, yeah. between, like, say, Echo, Aurora, and LA, they're just so different in the way they work. And then with yourself and... You've got um, Jackson Shaw, Danny Steele, Carl Parker, and you've got so many people coming through the academy that work distinctively different. And I think that's why it's been so good because, again, you don't want the same show. You don't want a show with the same match repeated, repeated, repeated. And there is such a diverse coming through. And I think Reach, again, uh, Jason and Grayson both got their DBSs. They've gone through the correct safeguarding um protocols that weren't even put in place 
in wrestling, especially before the speaking out movement. And it was something they still prided themselves in, of making sure they're running a safe environment for wrestlers. Because there is so many companies um, that that don't. And we've seen that in the past few months. And I want to talk about some of the guests. So you've had... Um, James Mason and you've you've had people like that coming in to teach you guys. Like what's what's the best advice you've had from a guest trainer? Oh there's a question. Um to be honest, every every guest trainer has has given something different. And I don't know whether accident or design, but they've all kind of focused on um on different things. Um, and I think the first seminar that, that was ever given was, was Dick Riley or, or Nikki Riley. And, um, but, but I, I was slightly later to join, so I missed that one, unfortunately. So as far as seminars go, I've, I've had seminars with, um, Joel, who, who's just like the best grounding you can have because he, he's just all about the wrestling, you know, you've got to be able to wrestle anybody, any place on the card at any time. Um, you've got to be able to have matches that you've planned. You've got to have, be able to have matches that you can't plan. Um, yeah, so his 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 uh, seminars are, you know, strictly kind of in the ring wrestling stuff. How many pins can we come up with? How many takedowns can we come up with? Um, and just, just little details about what makes sense about every little hold. Like, I think... In one of his seminars, I, I let go of a headlock and took took somebody's arm, and he just said, "Why would you ever do that? Why would you ever let go of a headlock? If you're in a fight, you would never let that thing go. Like having hold of somebody's arm is a weak position. Don't ever do that." Um, so yeah, that was great. We had um, Charlie Sterling, and uh, his thing was just all about never sell the same thing, never sell the the same thing the same twice. Or sorry. I don't want to see the same sell twice. So sell everything differently. Yeah. So if you get hit with one thing, sell it differently to what you got hit with before. Um, yeah, and I know that that's, that's a big focus of him. Like he loves um, Kurt Henning and all his like over the top sales. <laughs> um, Luke Phoenix was kind of all about finding um, what's um, like unique about yourself as a wrestler, like how you can, how you can separate yourself just in your presentation of yourself. Um, then we had uh, Chris Andrews. Uh, he was kind of just doing the basics really well, you know, making sure your foot works right, making sure you're moving in the right way, making sure you do the simple things perfectly. Um, and James Mason, he kind of wanted everybody to just put together a few things that you could, that you could fall back on. So yeah. If anything happens, you know, you know that you can just go into the sequence and rescue a match, get it back to where it needs to be. Um, and who else? We, and Eddie, I mean, Eddie Ryan, if you want to know uh, anything There's to do with. On the internet. Mm, big <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, reinventing yourself as a character, like marketing yourself, like Eddie's, you know, way out ahead in, in that regard. Oh, it looks fantastic. Um, yeah. So he's brilliant. I mean, he's, He's um, great to listen to about that. And also, you know, does a lot of the Joel stuff about, you know, just making sure that your wrestling is really tight and tidy. Um, I'm hoping that there's nobody that I've forgotten now. Yes, then. Oh, yes, then, yeah. Um, similar to Chris Andrews, which is rather unsurprising looking at them. But, yeah, he was, he was about um, uh, keeping your, your work aggressive. Um, yeah, simple things, keeping your work aggressive and um, making sure that you were there to fight. You know, when you yeah. even like, e when you get in the ring, even before you lock up, make sure make sure you're looking like you want to fight. Um, yeah, so about that kind of aspect of the the presentation of of your wrestling. Yeah, and again, like that's why it kind of elaborates on what I said that no academy students the same. Yeah, because you're bringing in so much, and you guys truly are getting the best education. It's not being used as a cash grab; it's being used because they genuinely want to make the Southwest professional wrestling scene a lot better. And it's only a matter of time that 
a lot of you from that academy are going to be breaking out further of a field. You've seen it with yourself with All Star, and I know a few of you have been getting some local bookings as well, uh, with companies wanting you to be part of their roster, which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I want to go on to the like the last one of the last matches, then really. And mm. when we first did this interview, I gave you an insight on something that Joel said about yourself and like how that had felt. But obviously that interview is now out. Uh, Mm. You had a chance to listen to it. How does it feel the fact that somebody that you held in such high regard and is truly one of the best in the UK to actually handpick you as somebody who wants to work with and actually respect the fact that you got your way um, to be respectful, to greet yourself? Because again, with Joel, his work ethic is so high. If you're not willing to work as hard as he'd work, essentially, it wouldn't lower his it wouldn't lower his uh, quality for somebody. And in that interview as well, he mentioned he called out names that people that just don't have that attitude work. But you're the different. He, he wants to actually wrestle you. How does that feel? Yeah, I mean that's that's you know quite amazing to to hear. Really, it's. <laughs> Joel was the the first ever seminar that I went to and like I said I joined late so by the time we had so by the time I had a seminar with Joel I'd probably been wrestling for two weeks so it was just embarrassing you know like like you said he doesn't lower his standards and you know I've literally had five hours of wrestling um so it's always kind of been burnt into me that I'd like to yeah I'd like to sort of gain some level of respect from him Um, and it is nice to hear that, you know, he appreciates that I come up and ask for his advice and speak to him and, and, and treat him well, because sometimes you think, you know, people think that I'm pestering them, you know, are they too busy? Do they not want to speak to me? Um, but no, and, and talk about lowering his standards, you know, why should he, you know, like if I, I think I, I shared a, um, a tweet by, um, Lance Storm that said, uh, people will forgive you for being green because everybody's green to start with, but they won't forgive you for being out of shape. And, you know, I feel like that with Joel, you know, like I think if, if you, if you turn up and try and work with a veteran and you're, and you can't keep up and you're, you're out of shape, I think that's really disrespectful. I think the, the least that you can do is make sure that you can go at a pace that they want to go at, you know, it's, it's not up to you. It's up to them. And, and if you make a mistake and you're not good enough, well, you've made a mistake and you're not good enough. You're green. But, you know, if they're sort of trying to fire up and you're dragging yourself off the mat, I just don't think that's on. Um, but, no, it's, it's, it's good to hear, and, and I hope it happens down the line. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and, and also, why, you know, why, why wouldn't you ask for advice? I mean, the, the advice that I've got from, from, me, from these people has just been so helpful. Um, like I said, from, from day one, um, Lance Cole just saying you need to pick these moments to, to you know, show people that you're firing up and you're getting aggressive um, and you want to fight. Um, and it's funny because uh, that was the kind of thing that I was focusing on to start with. Because when, when you start out, you're, um, you're just thinking, I've just got to get through this match. You know, is there anything that I've gotten? So as I had more and more matches, it was that I, I really wanted to, you know, focus on what he told me and pick out the bits that would make me look uh, I remember I've heard Stone Cold Steve Austin say, "Babyface has got to have fire. You've got to have fire. You've got to make people believe that you want to fight and keep going." Um, and I had a, a, a match with a tag match with Danny Steele against Brendan White and um, poor old Josh not suffering me again. <laughs> and um, and just You're all just that. You're just gonna fight forever, you two, aren't you? Like, <laughs> no. just gonna... yeah. every, every time he turns up to a show, he's just like, "I suppose it's me and you again." Um, <laughs> Yeah, and all day I was just thinking, like, doesn't nothing else matter? Just fire up, just fire up, show some fire. Um, and Danny tagged me in, and I sort of came in and sort of made a bit of a comeback. And because I've been thinking about it so much, <laughs> I just I ended up just giving it the ultimate warrior on the top rope, shaking the top rope. You know, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and um, and uh, Jason came up to me afterwards. And was just like, you were firing up, you were firing up. That was great. I was, and it was cool that he was, at the time, just by chance, stood next to Lance. He was like, hey, he's firing up. I've told him to fire up. He's firing up. And um, so, yeah, so that would, I hope that Lance is like, ah, I told him to do that ages ago. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and then the the kind of the, the next thing that I really needed to to work on was PJ Jones said your continuity of selling isn't good enough. Um, so you, you'll sell something pretty well and then you'll kind of carry on like it never happened or you won't kind of retain the sell for long enough. Um, I think I'm remembering this story and that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carry um, on. So for the next few matches, that was my thing, you know, um, make sure that I'm consistent in my selling. And if somebody's just, you know, taking my knee out, you know, worked on my knee for five minutes, when you make your comeback, don't act like nobody's ever touched your knee. Um, and then I worked a match with Kean Fox, who's another guy that has just been unbelievably kind and great to me. Um, and towards the end, he just gave me a low blow, took the nuts out. And, um, and then I ended up winning, pinned him. And when I celebrated, I didn't sell my nuts. And um, Bino came and said, you've just been low blowed and, you know, you celebrated. And, and I was just so pissed off. Um, not with Bino, with myself. Yeah. Because that, that's like the thing that I, need, I knew that I needed to be doing. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of like, right, this isn't happening again. So the match after was... Uh, the match against Carl Parker, so and uh, yeah, with the, the Shawn Michaels start, um, and he he was going to start working on my my leg, um, so I just put I just thought I'm not having this. I'm going to put a stone in my shoe. So I went outside, got a big rock, put a rock in my boot, and I just thought, oh, well, you're not going to forget now because you're walking <laughs> walking around on a rock. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my my uh, way of forcing myself to learn that. What, what was Jason's reaction and Grayson's when you're like, oh, that's great selling that, and you're just pulling a rock out of your boot? <laughs> I don't think I've ever told them. I think you're the only surprise. Person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. Yeah, I know. I've uh, just been working on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and t- I think looking at watching my my sort of last few matches, the thing the thing that I really want to work on now is like the pacing of my comeback because. Um, you're kind of tempted because it's your time to really fire and fire and um, um, yeah, and start getting up. It's, it's kind of that you want to be fast, but if you watch the great comebacks that we all know, they're, they're still pretty steadily paced. The intensity goes up, but they, they're not like rushed. If you think about like Cena's comeback or Shawn Michaels' comeback, you know, when he's given the, like, the atomic drops, like yeah. he's not rushing anything. He's got plenty of time for the crowd, but just because his intensity goes up. It feels like much more intense and like it's faster. Um, yeah. So that's whenever, whenever I get wrestling again, that's really what I want to, what I want to start on that sort of pace and of, you know, little, little comebacks and, you know, even like the finish. Yeah. So what was it like? You mentioned you'd main evented the Academy shows, obviously would be being champion, but it was reached the homecoming show. Again, you can find that on your fight site. It was yourself, teaming with Eddie Ryan against the team of Yeston Rees and Joel Redman. And like you said, the way um, people will be able to see from the promo graphics and like if they're following you on Twitter, you are like a body guy. You're in fantastic shape. And now you're against three guys that are also in that bracket and probably what you look to in terms of, right, that's that's how I want to marry with them three. What was your reaction when you got told... Hey, look! Your main event in a main reach show. You're teaming with Eddie Ryan, and you're facing Joel and Yeston. Um, uh, Jason and Grayson, uh, they just sent me a screenshot of the match graphic with the four of us in it, and I just saw it and just went, "Oh, god!" <laughs> <laughs> and this sort of like feeling of terror sort of entered my stomach because um, because Tab. T- most people won't know Tavistock's my hometown. That's what you know. I lived there for for years and years. Um, so, you know, there, there were lots of people that I knew in the crowd, and I just thought, oh, brilliant! You know, thanks, thanks for slinging me out of my depth, and you know, chucking me in one of the matches. You know, where I have the worst worst body of the four. Cheers for that. But um, but then the um, the yeah, the excitement started to build, and I just thought, you know, what an opportunity, and also. You know, th- these lads are, are so good. You know, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so that was how I, I found out about it and just kind of 
got more and more excited. And uh, on the day, it, the match previous was the match against Kean Fox, and um, and he ended the match with a cut eye. Nothing to do with me, Governor. I never touched him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so I was already at the venue, and Joel Joel walked in and just got his wallet out and just started putting money in my face, going. How much is it going to cost me for you to look after me tonight? You're not going to work me, are you? <laughs> uh, and then we kind of went back and you know started getting our gear on, and um, and Joel just said, "Right, we're uh, we're not talking about the match until the interval." And I just thought, "Oh God, I'm just going to be stewing here, panicking," because um, there was the interval, and then uh, PJ Jones, Simon Miller, so. 10, 15 minutes, and then us. So basically, from nothing, we've got to put this thing together in 15 minutes. Yeah. So I just thought, oh, brilliant, thanks. And it's, in a way, it's, it's easier for them because they've, they've wrestled each other so many times that they can say, you know, that thing you like to do at the start or, you know, the, then you go up and, you know, do that thing that you do. Yeah. It's the first time I've wrestled any of them, so it's all from scratch for me. Um, but it was... It was my, I mean, it was my favourite match. I mean, the, the crowd were into it. I thought the match was pretty good. Um, and just to be in there with, with, with those three guys, it was almost like, right, this is, this is the bar, you know. Um, because there aren't, you know, if you think about those, those guys, there aren't really many people better. So yeah. if, you, if, you get, if you get to that level, you know, you've got a chance of, of being where you want to be and going, going where you want to go. Um, <clears throat> and again, it was watching that match back. It was the little things that are different. You know, a- a- anybody can give a body slam. Anybody can do an arm drag, but it's the little things, the little, like the little bits of presentation that take it, take it to the next level that um, are the difference between those guys and, and everybody else. So what was it like, after the match then so you've gone in and when you uh reflecting when you got the advice like what was your advice from those three like what was the feedback um, yeah really good um, i've one thing that i've learned is that there are people that have been in the business for a length of time that they sort of feel like they should give you some feedback even if they haven't got anything and it's usually like a sort of 15 minute sort of word salad that you feel like you should be able to pick something out of um but like when there are guys like that 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 know you know know what they're talking about so much, it's a couple of sentences really. I mean, yeah, Yestin came up to me first and said, "When you first come out the curtain, just watch your um, watch the poses because you're sort of bordering on villain. So just make sure that you know you're not looking too cocky." And that yeah. was it. Um, and Joel just said, um, "Set yourself lower on your arm drags." You, you're not as easy as you could be to get over at the moment. And that was it. And you think, brilliant, I can use both of those things straight away. Yeah. No, and it is those, rather than giving you a massive spiel of telling you what was great, that is what you want, and you want in that constructive criticism. You're wanting to know what you can improve. So when we're back to normal and yeah. we are watching you either in attendance or on your fight site, I'm expecting you to be lower on your arm drag so Joel can get over you quickly. <laughs> exactly, I know. How dare I make him jump? But, um, uh, yeah, and then, and then the funny thing is, is that so that was kind of a massive high for me, you know, main event in a match in my hometown with those four guys. And then the next day was that show in Western Supermare where I looked out the ring and the guy was asleep. So it kind of wow. gives you like the... Uh, the ups and downs of you know starting out and being on the road as a wrestler. Yep, that is literally such a high to be like, yeah, and we're back to reality. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, he's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are, what are your goals in wrestling? Then is, for example, like the three people we just spoke about, all three of them, um, in different capacities, have worked for WWE. Joel is currently um, working for All Japan. What what are your goals? Is it going to Japan? Is it just working more on circuits um, and different independent companies? Or is NXT and WWE the, the ultimate goal? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I would 100% like to, to wind up in, in WWE. You know, I think when you 
when you say things like that, you kind of you set yourself up to look like an idiot because it's more likely than not that it won't happen. And then people can say, thought you were going to WWE. But um, no, I've always been one that if if I start something, I want to see, I want to be as good as I can be at it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that the ultimate goal would definitely be um, to work in WWE. Um, I think in the in the medium term, um, I'd just like to work in as many places for as many people as I can, maybe a few different countries, um, and, and just get to a point where um, you know people sort of the the other the other boys will sort of see me on a card and just think, oh cool, you know, I'd like to wrestle him or. You know, I wrestled him before and it was really good. You'll have a good one tonight. Just kind of have that level of respect that, um, you know, somebody will see my name and just think, you know, that'd be, that'd be good. No, definitely. So with Reach, you're going after the main title. You're going to be winning it. Who do you want that match with when you, fight, when you become the first Academy student to win the Reach Championship? Um, well, that's a good question. I think partly because I have, I've sort of, I've been in the the ring with with Joel and uh, and Eddie and Yestin now. I think that the 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 other guy in the sort of championship picture is Charlie. So I, I would really like to to have a match with Charlie. I just think he's so he's so creative in what he does. Um, I think. Um, he ticks every box, you know, for what you need to be as a, as an incredible wrestler. Um, he's he's an incredible athlete, you know. He's he's, he's great in the ring. Um, he can do things that not many people can do at his size. And he, when I talk about the little bits and pieces, the little things and the little cells, I think he's as good as anybody. Um, especially on offense, you know, if he's doing if he if he uh, strikes somebody, you'll often see him just kind of, oh, you know, I just hurt yeah. my hand a bit. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to definitely have a match with him. I, and, and Luke Phoenix is somebody that I'd really like to have a match with. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, yeah, he he's he's the sort of guy that, you know, Joel talks about, you know, could have a match with anybody anywhere just because there aren't really any holes in his game. You know, great sort of technician and... Um, and and just an unbelievably nice bloke as well. You know, you'd you'd, you'd have a good night working with Luke for sure. So one person that's been the academy student and he's somebody that essentially created this relationship with myself and Reach is Omega Luke. Yeah. Um, Luke's been very vocal that once everything's back to normal, he's looking forward to his debut and he wants to come after your title. So what do you think to Luke? wanted to pursue and take what's yours um yeah I, I mean i think luke has impressed everybody with how quickly he picked things up he, he um picked up the basics pretty quickly he looks like a um a decent athlete um and he certainly you know knows what's required of you as a as a wrestler you know he's, yeah. he's watched enough of it um yeah, I mean, if he if he keeps going the way he's going, there's no reason why he can't get himself a shot. Whether whether I'll still be carrying the thing is another story, but <laughs> um, yeah, no, I reckon Luke will be just fine. So, as the academy champion, and originally this was going to be one of the from the ground up series, but I think I'm just going to adapt it as an interview um, with a wrestler. And if we do elaborate more on the training side of things, then great. So. For those that are listening and uh, thinking of getting into the industry or um, the training or anything like that, what advice would you give them as somebody that's just breaking through? Um, I think the, the first piece of advice or the first thing that uh, people need to know is that, yeah, I mean, the, the, the business has been exposed now. You know, the cat's out of the bag. We're, we're not trying to kill each other. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. You know, I've... I've um, been involved in, you know, what if you call it a legitimate sport, um, and it's no harder than wrestling. Let me tell you, you know, like the the ring's hard, people's limbs are hard, 
yeah. the outside of the ring is even harder. Um, and to get good at it, you need so many reps that by the time by the time you get in the ring, you know you're going to be pretty beaten up. Um, so yeah, don't be. I know that there's kind of a. It's kind of split in some regards wrestling where there's kind of like people that like an athletic approach and a legitimate contest and then people that kind of like the sort of equal opportunities kind of drama performance um either way whichever whichever one you know you like you've got you've got to bump and you've got to know how to protect yourself and you've got a you've got to know uh, how to look after people um so yeah just no matter what you think about wrestling just know that it's it's hard yeah and if people are doing seminars in your local area try and travel as well i've known plenty of people personally where they may not go to every training session or they've been getting some of the best trainers on their doorstep and they've still not gone there like it's never too like in any field it's never too late to um like you don't want to stop learning and things like that so Again, definitely do that. And if you are in the southwest um, area, make sure you do reach out to Reach, whether it's as a fan or if you are interested in getting into professional wrestling, have a look at Reach for one of the companies. Again, and it's not just blowing smoke. It's from this conversation with yourself, it's proven how much they do value in nurturing new and young talent and doing right by yourself. So make sure you do follow Reach. So, uh, Joey, again, thank you for coming on the show. Um Second time, like now telling this story, I think touch would we'll have to do it the third. Otherwise, I'll probably just tell the story for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, apologies for the um, technical stuff from the first time. But again, it's been a pleasure, and I hope like, I'm looking forward to see what's next once the COVID pandemic's over and wrestling goes back to normality. Really excited to see where your career takes you. Yeah, thank you, mate. And uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you again. And don't worry about, you know, the, the technical stuff. It's um, these things happen. As we've seen, the world isn't perfect and um, unexpected things happen. But it's been a pleasure to talk to you again, mate. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll catch you down the road, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Where can people find you on social media? Um, they can find me at uh, joey.7 on Instagram. Uh, Joey Seven Wrestler on Facebook and at Joey Seven Two on Twitter, and that's the words Joey Seven and then the number two. When I was making your graphic, I was wondering why two at the end of Joey Seven. Because there was a Joey Seven before me, the darn rascal. Did Did you not think of like Joey Seven and then the number seven? Yeah, right, mate. <laughs> I know well, that no. Who now? Somebody's gonna get in touch and be like, oh you can buy Joey 77 off me. Well I'm now just creating it now. <laughs> <laughs> but now on that note, uh that's been my interview with the Academy champion Joey Seven. Uh make sure you give him a follow, make sure you watch uh check out Reach again, you can find them on your fight site. And make sure you have a look at all my interviews with the Reach guys. I won't spill them all because it's getting to the point I've done more Reach interviews than I have other interviews. I've uh, been loving to tell the stories. And make sure, if you haven't already, uh, AAA world champion, well, former AAA champion Mil Muertes, El Messias, came onto the Kate Johansson show. Make sure you check both of those interviews out. And... Yeah, thank you for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe. Until next time. Friday morning.